you build a lot of these skills so that when you go into the bad times, you have this whole bag of really heavy skills that you can then use to navigate your way through and to help other people navigate their way through. Salutations, listeners, and welcome back to Glitch Bottle, the podcast where we uncork the uncommon in magic, mysticism, and the generally misunderstood. I'm Alexander F., and today we are so honored to welcome back to the podcast author, occultist, magical teacher, and tarot expert, Josephine McCarthy. So magically and otherwise, we intuitively feel or we might know that there are good times and then there are the tough times in our lives, our communities and across the globe. And in quiet times, why is it so important for magical practitioners to learn, to study and to grow? And when challenging times come, why do magical shortcuts never work? And how can magicians offset negative effects of the bad times in their own sphere? Well, there's no one better to ask than the excellent Josephine McCarthy, who it's always such an honor and a pleasure to chat with. Josephine is based in the UK and has been active in magic for more than 40 years while teaching and writing on Western mystery themes for more than 25 years. Josephine began teaching magical groups in 1993 in the USA and the UK, and she's authored dozens of books on magic that cover a menagerie of different focus areas and in-depth explorations of topics. She also is the director of Quaria, a free online magical training course that takes participants from apprentice to adept. In this episode, we're so thankful for Josephine's time as she returns on the podcast to share about the importance of long-term magical growth and practice. And also very exciting, Josephine updates us on a series of 79 detailed paintings for a new deck that Josephine has been creating in the last few years, as well as so much more. And now to help us uncork the uncommon, let's welcome back Josephine McCarthy. Josephine McCarthy, thank you so, so much for stopping back on the Glitch Bottle podcast today. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It's always a joy to speak to you. Thank you. Can you share with us the genesis behind your journey to paint an entirely new deck that I know you've been posting images of over the last few years? Can you share with us about this deck and and the paintings behind it? Yeah, I didn't plan to do it originally because I'm not a, an artist. You know, I'm a performer. I was a worked in ballet and theatre. I live with an artist, and I used to enjoy dabbling with paint. But then when Stuart and I got together, it was really intimidating because he's a professional artist. And, you know, I was like a five-year-old doing stick people that you could put up on the fridge. So I didn't paint for the longest (laughs) time. And he just kept saying, you need to paint, you need to paint. Go on, just for yourself, just do it for yourself. Well, I ignored that for a long time. And then Towards the end of 2019, there'd been a big buildup in 2019 from an inner point of view of something coming. It it was getting very difficult. And by December, I'd got a really strong message of stop, because at the time I was working on something, just a little bit of writing, stop writing, don't trigger any new magic, keep your head down, shut up, there's a storm coming. So I got my head down and of course, I'm, I'm a doer. I have to do. It's my name. It's what my name means is the worker, Josephine. Joseph Yusuf is the worker. And so I was sat there like donkey in the back of the the car on Shrek, I think it is. Just (laughs) what do I do now? What do I do now? So I thought, oh, I'll do a painting. I did a, a, a painting of a magical gate, an ornate gate, a power for the South, which is opening the way. And it was, it was just something that had been rolling around in my head for a while. So I, I painted this, this gate, this power gate, and it wanted putting up on our back door on the inside, which is in the south, south gate. It's like, okay, you can go there. Didn't think anything of it. 
Then in very early 2020, I had this dream. Everyone has dreams and I have processing dreams, which I recognize of, oh yeah, that's my brain doing its filing cabinet thing, psychology dreams. And then there's a very specific flavor to magical dreams. They come right into focus and I don't forget them. They're very clear. And this being just appeared and said, you need to paint the deck. And it was saying it needs to be a fully contacted process that you do yourself. And I woke up and it's like, fuck no, <laughs> you know, I'm not doing that. A, because <laughs> that is a lot of work. It would take a lot of money because that's a lot of canvas. I can't do small paintings like Stuart does. Stuart works on A4 a lot of the time, very detailed, because I don't have good motor skills with my hands. I have to work bigger. That's a lot of pain. That's a lot of, and I was coming out with all these excuses. Oh, I couldn't, couldn't possibly do that. And, you know, I'd, I'd feel an idiot because I'm not a good artist. In school, there's always those three or four in school who can draw really well and do really good stuff. And I wasn't one of them, really wasn't one of them. So I sort of brushed it off and brushed it off and it kept coming back. And it's like, you need to do this. So I thought, well, no, I don't actually. I do have the right to say no, but I'm going to paint a painting and see what comes out. And what came out was a rock, a rock outcrop. And it, it was quite moody and everything. And it was like, oh, that's interesting. And straight away, I had to take the south gate down off the back door and put up this rock. And of course, it's the foundation stone in the south. The south gates had opened, the foundation stone for the deck was there and ready. It was like, ah, okay. And while I was painting that rock, there's a something that happened that had not happened to me before with painting that happened throughout painting the deck was I just knew how to do something or I, I, by accident, I would do something and it would look really good and I couldn't repeat it. So it's not skill. Anything that is seen in those paintings is not skill. It's accident or something pushing my hand or moving my hand. So I thought, okay, right, I'll do it. I'll give it a go because that one doesn't look too bad. So the first process, I spent two months mapping. When you do a magical contacted deck, it's different from doing an artistic deck. Usually, you know, people... When they're doing decks, they either use the template of tarot or they do an oracle deck. And sometimes they're magically mapped and other times they're artistically, psychologically mapped in different ways. For a contacted deck, it has to have a pattern. It has to process its power in a circuit. And so it has to have balances within it. It has to have co-workers cards that work together, cards that oppose each other, all of this sort of thing. And it's a hell of a job. And it doesn't stop. You know, once you've mapped it, that's not fixed. That's your starting point. So I got the mapping done and then started the painting. I'd mapped for 77 cards. So off I went and started painting. And it ended up being 78 cards because I did the 77 and then you know, a week or so after it was another one was like, excuse me, you need to do me. So I did it. But I had a lot of struggling with it because I don't have the skills. So I found that really intimidating and, and difficult. But there was the last one. I know you'll probably ask later about the actual process that I went through and what I actually did. But this last one was was great. I had no idea what the hell it was. And I couldn't get my head around it because with each card, because they were mapped, I had an idea of where I wanted to go with it. Uh, this one, totally blank. Absolutely no fucking idea. And when I paint, each painting has music that it wants. And I ha it takes a while to find the right music. And it's like a switch goes on and then I can paint. So I found the right music for this, this last card. And it was a CD. Yes, I am still using CDs. I haven't yet moved into the 21st century. <laughs> um, it was a CD called The Sultan and the Saint. 
it's a magical exploration of the conversations between St. Francis of Assisi, who was a Christian mystic, and the Egyptian Sultan al-Malik al-Kalim, who was a Sufi. This was in the middle of the war, and they ended up getting together and having these mystical discussions. And the CD is a coming together of Christian and Muslim music that's inspired, that's Sufi, that's mystical. The actual, there was one song on it that I just had to keep on repeat. Thankfully, we live in a small house, so you can't get away from the music. And luckily, he's incredibly patient. But all the way through this painting, it had to be the same. And it's sung in Arabic, but it's the canticle of Brother Sun, Sister Moon, which is the prayer by St. Francis of Assisi, which is most high, all powerful, all good Lord, all praise is yours, all glory, all honour and all blessings, etc. Praise be to you, my Lord, of all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Sun, who is the day who gave you light. He is the beautiful and radiant with great splendour. Of you, most high, he bears the likeness. And it goes through the sun, the moon, the creatures, the land, the wind. It's a beautiful, beautiful canticle. So that was playing on a loop. So I'm painting away and I still had no idea what the fuck I was painting. And even when I'd finished it, it's like, what is that? You know, it's sort of semi-solid, could be sort of landscape, sun, light, and then this serpentine light serpentine shape going from the land to the sun or from the sun to the land. And this thing in my head just said, just put it on again and listen. And then I got it. It's like, oh, brother sun, mother land. It's the divine. It's like the unknowable, that vast divine consciousness that flows through everything that can't be depicted because we don't understand it. That's what it was when it wanted to be in the deck. So it's like, okay, uh, yeah, God wanted this painting painting and putting in the deck. Okay, I'll go with that one. And I just couldn't figure out where it fit in the map of the pattern of the deck. And, you know, because this is, I can be incredibly dense and I'm usually the last one to get stuff. And so I'm looking at the painting and I'm looking at the mapping because I have a big, big book of, paper that I map things out on and I'm like where do you where the hell do you fit what do you oppose what's your best friend you know who's your teacher who's your this who's your that and this voice just came through and said stupid cow it is all of that and it's like oh yeah duh, it is it's the power that flows through all of it so it's like the electric and the plug sockets and the deck was all the plug sockets, but it needed the electric as well. So that was it. So that's how I got going with it and just spent the last two years painting, not doing any writing, keeping my head down, keeping out the way and just painting this deck. Josephine, this definitely leads into the question about process. And I, we've had guests on the podcast before, artists, esoteric practitioners who are very familiar with your work, like Meredith Graves and Nika Danilova, uh, aka Zola Jesus, Coleman Stevenson. And we talk a lot about how art is magic and magic is art. And you mentioned the process of tapping into the deeper meaning behind musical incantations. Can you Can you share a little bit more about that process? Did you use specific consecrated materials? Did you have any timings, you know, moon phases, things like that, or anything I think you could share would be so fascinating. Before I answer that, for Meredith, if she's listening, she sent me something and I want to say thank you. It's amazing and how prescient in life what is happening. So, because I sent her an email, but then we're both the same. We're both incredibly busy and have a lot of people contacting us that it's easy for an email to disappear. So just in case it disappeared. Awesome, Meredith. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I didn't use consecrated tools. I didn't work to astrological or lunar timings because when you're bringing a new structure into the world, that can actually be counterproductive, which seems a bit weird, but it's what I found over the years. When when something's not a new structure, but you're working with it, 
you can time and work with tools. I mean, that's part of magic. You work with consecrated tools, you work with tides and all of that sort of thing. But when you're bringing a new structure into the world, you don't do any of that. It needs to, it's like a child, it needs to become itself. Because these things have their own timing. They have to go through a process of conception, pregnancy and birth. It's like when, before my grandson was born, before he was even conceived, he was hanging around for a couple of years before. And I just kept picking up on this child, kept picking up on this child. And then when she was pregnant, it's interesting because when you're pregnant, you and the baby meld with each other for a while until you become, again, separate beings. So with a painting, with something as big as this, it has to go through the same process. You have to learn to not want to control everything. You can't control everything. What you are is a tool. You are the consecrated tool. I'm a consecrated magician and a bishop. That allows me to be used as a consecrated tool. And with the timing, I, I knew I had to be very flexible with it, but I learned a shitload about magical timing by actually doing this, which is what I keep saying in magic. By doing, you learn. You don't learn and then do. You do and you learn. An example of the timing issue. What they would do is, because <laughs> again, I'm an idiot. If you hadn't noticed, there are parts of my personality that are very anal retentive and extremely like, it has to be organized. You have to be on time, blah, de, blah, de, blah. Like when I was doing the, the Quarrier course, I worked to a very strict regime and that enabled me to write that much in three years. So I thought I'll approach it that way. It will take me approximately five to seven days to do a painting so I can get this many paintings done. I'll have two weeks off there and then carry on there. And that was my plan, which went straight out the window. One example, this year, February. What I do, I didn't paint them in sequence of how they are and in their pattern. I tried to, and it wouldn't work. So there was a lot of wasted canvas. So then I thought, okay, you come forward and tell me when you're ready to be painted. So I started talking to the cards that would be as fetuses in the womb because the conception had already happened. The foundation had been painted. The map was in place. Mm. That's the conception. So now it's a pregnancy. And like the timing of a birth with a baby, if it's a natural start of the birth, it comes from the child, not the mother. The child's body triggers the birth, not the mother's body. So I had to do the same for each one. It was like having 78 kids. So come to February, the card that wanted doing was danger. And I had an idea in my head that I wanted to do an image that would be generic because danger can come from all different sorts of angles. And I wanted it to be understood that it's a clear, you know, it could be danger of accident, danger of illness, danger of stupidity, that sort of thing. So I was thinking sort of semi-abstract, whatever. So I started it on the 19th of February, started putting a background down. The background started to form itself. What I do is I don't work tidily. I work messily. I, I Putting backgrounds down, I use a kitchen sponge and sponge all over and get shapes. And this being started to come out of the shape and my hackles went straight up. It was like, what the fuck? I don't want to do that but it was really insistent and it wanted the right music. So I turned off the music that was on and I tried different CDs. No, 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 no. Got to Holst's Planet, Mars. Yes, that. Put it on repeat. So it's like, oh, poor Stuart, you know, seven days of Mars going constantly. <laughs> He's learned to put earbuds in and just listen to his own music. So I started painting it. And what came through was this humanesque figure rising out of the rocks, the land. So it was like part of the land and it had this helmet and armor that was all spiky and the arms were formed out of the rocks and they were reaching out to grab the viewer. And in front of the figure and what was the body of the figure was it morphed into this volcanic type fiery darkness and it is that the figure had risen up out of the fiery depths. 
and behind it was a column of red fiery that went up in a column and then swirled out sort of type maybe suggesting wings or form or something the figure itself had no humanity it just had two red dots for the eyes and I got it finished on the 24th and I put it up on my private Facebook on the 25th now when I paint it's very different to when I write when I write I do so many thousand words a day and then I switch off and I go do my other jobs and I have a part-time job and, you know, I have editing and all these sort of things. And I'm also relatively ADD. So what I have to do is take breaks and look at the news, blah, 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 blah. So when I'm painting, I don't do any of that. I go in the kitchen. That's my studio. Stand in the kitchen and I paint. I take a break after a couple of hours, have a cigarette, cup of coffee, go back in, paint. That's it. Nobody speaks to me. I don't want disturbing, I just paint. So I did that for five days. When, when, I, when I was getting close to finishing it on the, the 24th, um, Stuart came in and put his head around the door and had a look and he went, holy fuck. And it's like, <laughs> yeah, danger. And he said, no, Putin. And it's like, what? He said, Putin's just invaded Ukraine today. It's like, oh, shit. Oh, wow. But, so it's like, okay, maybe, you know, coincidence, but good timing for the painting. So what was going on there was the prequel to an invasion and the invasion itself puts out an energy when there's a big happening, regardless of what it is, whether it's good or bad. From a fate perspective, there's a long inner prequel. And then there's a, an outer, like, not warning, it's almost like the entrance, the beginning, before it actually begins. And again, that can be long or it can be short, but it has a very specific power to it. And that's one of the things you use in divination, you can pick up on that. And then you have the actual thing itself, then has its own power. Once I'd finished all this and found that out, I, I, did, I don't often do readings anymore, but I did a reading. It is what I think happening happening because I needed to learn something. And it's like, yes, what you think is happening is happening. And what was happening is it had to time in with that prequel and event because those two powers of prequel and event had to be bridged into the painting. It's like washed in it. It, it had to be made while that was happening so it could soak that power up, that inner energy. So the card doesn't represent danger. It is danger, if that makes sense. It's the inner power mm. of that danger imprints into the painting. So, and this was teaching me a lot because this kept happening with different staff. And that's with the timing is this is why I, I would ask them, do you want to be done now? Yeah, okay, I want to be done now. Another one was um, communication, communion. I had an idea of a figure going out on Dartmoor and, and communing with the elements. It, again, one of those I couldn't, I couldn't quite get to start it. Things kept getting in the way. And then eventually it's like, no, you can do me now. Okay. So I started the painting, painting away. And I couldn't paint what I wanted to paint. It just wasn't having it. And so I let it just do its thing. And these three beings came out, wind beings like wind dragons. It's like, oh, they're cute, wind dragons. And there's this little lady with her arms up and you'll see from the state of her arms and everything that I am not an artist or a painter, but she's like, yay, wind beings. And she's talking to them. That week while I was painting it, we got hit by three very, very harsh wind storms that did a lot of damage, all three of them. And I didn't, because I, I'm dumb, I didn't make the connection until I was almost finished again and Stuart put his head around the door and went, oh, wow, well, yeah, it's the three stones. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good Lord. I mean, seriously. But there's a lot, So, and it's like the, the energy of the windstorms goes into the painting. So when you're working with them, from a divination perspective, it's the act it has a fragment of the actual power of what it's talking about. 
and it's almost like a homeopathic dose of it. So it's not like, you know, you get danger card out and your house is going to fall down. But so that you get used to the very subtle energetic feelings of them, which becomes a different energetic layer of divination as well. Because one of the things that I didn't plan it, but it became evident through putting it together and then working on the book is that this is all to work on different levels. So not just with divination, there's a, a lot of different things that it's, it needs to do. And in terms of the actual process, they, it was ordinary brushes, acrylic paint, canvas, no skill, just intention, and chatting with them and making friends with them and then learning that some of them are really not a good idea to have in the bedroom. Very small house, really small house, nowhere to put anything. So they were stacking up in the bedroom and uh, some of them were fine. But some of the more dangerous ones were a really bad idea because we didn't get a night's sleep. So we ended up having to hire a little space in the village, a uh, storage space to put them in because otherwise we weren't going to sleep for two years. And what I also did, because of the way that I want them to work, I consecrated them. Each individual one, once it was finished, was then consecrated. So it becomes a working tool, but also it, it stops anything that shouldn't be there from flowing out of it or into it. It seals them, basically, and turns them into a very well-tuned tool. The other thing I found was, you know, some of the some of the early ones, by doing 78, well, it was actually 79 paintings because I did the backing as well. 79 paintings over two years, you learn you start to learn how to manipulate paint and how to use a brush properly and stuff like that. And Stuart was really good. He just left me to it because he said at the beginning, do you want, how much input do you want from me? And I'm one of those people I like to do it myself. And then I can turn around and say, what do you think? Is this okay? Or do I need to do something else or that sort of thing? But in terms of actually doing it, I wanted to figure it out myself. So he left me to it. And I, I learned all these different skills as I'm as I'm working along and I learned that there's a thing of underpainting, which was a bit of a weird one for me. But I he said, oh, there are some other artists in the past that, that did that. For example, I'd paint painting and it was the best I could do at the time. And the contact was like, that's fine, put it away, good. And I'd move along. And then about a year after, it was like, well, you know, you need to get that painting out again. Well, I don't know what to do with it. Well, you're going to repaint it. What? You're going to repaint it. Okay. Am I going to repaint it over the original? No, you're going to paint over that other one. But but that, that's one of the cards that I've done. No, no. You're going to paint over that one, and that will then become the fake creation card at first. It was workable, but it, it wasn't doing its job as it needed to. So it, it needed to be repainted, but it needed to be repainted over another painting. And I was like, I can't get my head around this. It would make sense to repaint it over the original, which is consecrated because I'd finished it. And it was like, no, no, it needs an element that you don't understand that's in that other painting. And that other painting is not fit for its purpose now. So I paint over that one. Okay. So I paint over that one. It's like, well, what about that card now? Oh, you don't need that. Okay. And this happened a few times. So there was some of the early ones that I did turned out to be placeholders and underpaintings for a different card. And they didn't actually need to be in the deck, but I wouldn't have got the power right and the skill right if I'd have gone for the later card straight away. I've been learning all sorts about layering and embedding, how you embed elements of power. And it also made me look a lot more at, because it happened more with the core powers than anything else, that they're a lot more complex than I'd realized and that they needed certain elements to also, not just to boost them, but for some to stabilize them, that on their own, it was too much of this or too much of that, and it needed an anchor or a stability or a counterpoint underneath it for it to work. 
And so none of those, because I don't, this is something I'd not come across before. I had to just go with, with the process. And so when a painting wanted overpainting with another painting, I just went with it and just took notes, wrote my journal, tried to learn as much as I could about the mixture. And what I did on some of them was, because they're on stretches at the moment, I wrote on the back of the stretches, you know, the process of, oh, cross out, no, that was this card, now it's this card because of this. And when it, a painting had timed in with an event, I'd put the event on the back as well because what I want to do is put them up for sale if anyone is stupid enough to buy them because they're just not fine art. But I've realised now because of the economic meltdown in this fucking country, shipping something the size of a stretched canvas out this country would cost just about as much as the painting itself. So we're going to take them off the stretchers and roll them. So I'll put in on paper on signed paper of, you know, this is information that goes with this painting. This is what's underneath it. This is when it was done, that sort of thing. So that if somebody wants to work magically with them, they know what they're working with. It was an interesting learning process. That is incredible for so many reasons. One of those is it it really touches on something you say all the time, Josephine, which is when people embrace esotericism, there tends to be a lot of mental chatter, a lot of issuing, you know, commands or requests to spirits. And and you are sharing this deeply organic, esoterically organic, deeply listening, infused receptivity and journeying through that by doing. That's just so powerful. That's great. But that's how it needs to be for what I want it to be. When I did the Quarrier deck, which I didn't paint, it's done by proper artists. When we put that together, that was for the Quarrier course, for the Initiates and Adapt. And it's a part teaching deck. It's a divination deck. It's also a magical development deck. But much wider people are are working with it now. But, you know, one of the things that has niggled at me, and I, I really wanted to do something about it, I think we've talked about this before, maybe in the 2019 podcast, these tides of destruction that have been building up and building up and building up since around 2010. And then now they've been outing for the last sort of three, four years. Writing Quarry was a part of that to send learning forward into the future. But I realized through talking to people that, you know, are walking a magical path or magical learning themselves. They're not necessarily doing training or anything. Um, And people from all different magical backgrounds is the isolation. And it really came into focus, particularly with the pandemic. There's, you know, people need a guide, a companion, an advisor, a mirror to bounce things off of. That was one of the things that I wanted to do. And it's like, do I do it as a book? How do you do that? Because it's got to reach across lots of different cultures and and different readerships. And I found through Quarrier that it's not, that's not as easy as it looks. You've got to find a generic vocabulary that can stretch across all these different groups of people. And then it struck me, one side sort of stopped wriggling under the grip of you will do this deck. And one side stopped wriggling and said, okay, then. And started to paint it. I realized that's what it was, is, you know, I'd said a few years ago, what can I do? And this is the answer, basically, is do this, keep busy, keep your head down, paint. So the actual purpose of it is to be a guide, a companion, an advisor, a mirror, and a vocabulary for divination that stretches through time, backwards, forwards, present, which means that what's in them needs to be as recognisable as possible across a widest group of people and magical backgrounds. So it's not working within a system, which is what the Quarrier deck does. It, It does work within a system and it can work out the system, but it does work with the system. This has to be not about a system, it's about the process on the path. And it's about the development of your process on the magical or mystical or both path. And 
regardless of where you come from and what culture and what religion or whatever, there are certain core elements that are, you know, very much about humanity from an inner perspective, from a magical perspective, as they're forging forward, there are certain, you know, problems they come up against. There are certain blocks. There are certain types of beings. You know, there are certain necessities that are there, regardless of how you're doing it or where you're doing it. So the deck itself, and now I'm doing the book, I'm now putting in, because I, I gave them all names, but that was just their place names, holding names. Now they have very generic names like danger, endurance, you know, path, things like that so that they can be used across, regardless of what magical path someone's walking on, that they'll recognize, oh, that's what this is and that's what that is. And so you can use it to look at your own path going forward. You can use it, what's going on out in the world, but also you can work with it when you hit a wall or you've fallen down a deep hole or you feel a lot of stuff pressing in and you don't know what the hell's going on, is you can use it to show me what's going on. Right, what's the underneath power of what's going on? Oh, it's that underneath power, okay. That I just need to keep out of the way of. And, and then the deck will go, well, actually, no, you need to think about this, this or this. So it's, it's like having a granny, a magical granny on the end of the phone. So you're not alone. And because they're consecrated images, they're doorways for these beings to come through in a safe way. And so because of that, there are certain images that are abstract so that what is necessary can come through. It's not formed by something. I also tried when I was doing people, there's some people in the deck. A, I can't paint people. I just can't. Um, so I slowly, and you'll see through the deck when it comes out, this sort of stage of development, you'll see which ones are the earlier cards and which ones are the later cards. I sort of developed my own little style for humans. And I tried to make them as genderless as possible in as many places so they would relate to everyone. Whereas there were some that came out that were a specific gender. Why, I don't know. But, you know, for the for the most part, I'm trying, I try to include everyone in the mix because it's got to be used for everyone. People have got to be able to recognize themselves in there somewhere. And the powers, again, that are put forward are not within um, a set magical presentation. And, and I also cut across some of the sort of, I don't know the right way to, to say it, the orthodoxy. For example, you know, in a tarot deck, the chariot, and the chariot is a dynamic that is generic in itself. In the tarot decks, you have the four creatures in with the chariot often. In some religions, the four creatures and the chariot action come together, but they're not of each other. They're actually two separate powers that come together to create a particular event or happening but they also have their own things that they do that are separate. So I separated them. So like there's a card of the four creatures and then there's the chariot. And in the process of writing the book, what I do is there's a very brief description of the painting and the picture of the painting. There's the meaning of the painting and the power that's coming through it. And then there's the divination. And I also put, analogies at the bottom, the extra, which is something most of the time not to, that necessarily to do with magic. Sometimes it's history, philosophy, sometimes it's science. Because what I found through Quaria is that there's people from some cultures where there's just no language for something that's in Western magic. It, it just doesn't, the plugs don't go together. But I found if I went through mythology or through science, well, you know, in biology, it does this. It's the same dynamic. It's not that, you know, magic and science are the same. They're not. But 
in science, it expresses like this. In magic, it expresses like that. And they, ah, yeah, got it, got it. So there's a lot of, in each card, there's an extra of an analogy so that you, you can work that way. And I wanted the book to work on its own if necessary. So that if one day in the future, somebody found the book and not the deck, they could work with the book to learn. There's a lot of teaching in the book as well, which if someone's got the deck just to do divination, they're going to have to like go through three pages to get the divination in- information and stuff. Well, you know, suck it up. <laughs> this is doing right. a job. The meanings need to be there so that you get a much deeper understanding of what's going on. And in the book, then you could almost use it a bit like a divination thing itself is, you know, you're a magician, you've fallen down a dark hole, you need an inspiration or, or a rope or a hook or something that's real that will help pull you up. And you don't have a deck of any sort. And you can flick through the book and just let it fall open and do that two or three times and let them speak. Because once I've finished the book, I'm at the moment I'm first drafting it. Once I've finished the book, then I'll magic pattern it. I'll magically pattern it, which I always, if I'm going to do that, it has to be done after it's drafted. It's not magically imprinting into the book. It's magically tuning the book to the deck. So I'll tune the words, the utterances of the book to the images of the deck so that they can flow together. And that way, then the book can be used. And if someone's got it as a free PDF, because I'll make sure that, you know, people can get hold of it for free if they need to. If it's just on a pad or something that they can just scroll at the finger and see where it lands, work like that. This sort of thing is, it's important. The easy good days have gone and they're going to be gone for a good while. The difficult times that we're going through at the moment are the warm-up act. And so people, especially in magical communities, pagan communities and things like that, any tool possible that will help people get through, evolve, survive, flourish, anything And this is, I'm going to get shot down in flames for this, but, you know, I'm an opinionated old cow. So, and I've got to the age, I'm postmenopausal, so I think it's my right to just say what the fuck I want. Magicians of my age who have gone through decades of work like I have, who are head above the parapet, 90% of them are not, by the way, but the ones with the heads above the parapet that write, that do this, we all have a responsibility to put something out there to help people for what we're in now and what is to come. And it needs to be accessible. Yes, we also need to earn a living and even more so now. The very tough times are here in England and are coming big time. So yes, so I, I do need to sell the deck. I do need to sell the book, but I also have a responsibility as a mature magician to make sure that those things are also accessible to people who cannot afford them, who don't have the money, who don't can't access them, that they're out there, that they can be downloaded. And different magicians who are experienced, not the pedestal standards who've read books for 10 years and think they're an expert, people who've been in the trenches for 30, 40 years and are producing work, it's just keep that in mind. What can you do? as well as, you know, the work you do to survive yourself financially. What can you do that you can put out there that will serve, that will help, and that's free? Because people are going to need this. And magicians my age who, who have worked for, you know, I was totting it up yesterday. I'm now on 45 years. It's like, you know, we have been given so much Not only did we live through the golden age of comfortable life, we were also in the golden age magically for people on the ground to work with, not just having to read books, but actually people to work with. And we've had the cooperation and help of inner beings and fate for donkey's years, protecting us, guiding us, teaching us. Everything that we do, everything that I've done is dependent on a lot of different things that have helped me 
including inner beings, inner contacts. I couldn't have painted the deck without inner contacts and beings working with me. And situations like, you know, I couldn't afford canvases. I, I run out of money. I just didn't. We live very frugally. I just could not afford to buy more canvases. And so canvases arrived. You know, and someone went, oh, I had a feeling the other day you'd run out of canvases, so I've sent you some. And he's like, oh, thank you. You know, that sort of thing. You have to give back, you know, and my age, my generation of magicians, we need to do that because we've been given so much. Now it's our turn to do that. So, sorry, end of rant. I completely lost thread of where I was and what I was talking about. But yes, end of rant. I'll shut up now. Josephine, no, this is a perfect transition to discussing the importance of preparing in the good times for those more challenging times. But before we get there, is there a place where listeners can check out progress on the deck and on the book? I know that you post some of those images to Facebook as well, but any any resources or any links, we'll make sure to link to those for sure. Not as yet. When I did Quarry, I was putting them up as I did them. And that's unusual for me. Usually I keep things under wraps until they're done for protection more than anything to protect them. And it, sadly, as I've become better known, it's become more important to do that because a female older magician who's opinionated becomes a target. And while it's not an issue magically, it becomes time-wasting and annoying and just for fuck's sake, just shut up and go away. So what I tend to do, so I'm not having to spend half my time just peeling shitty, pathetic magic off of stuff, is I keep things under wraps. And now the paintings are done, I can talk about them. What I will start to do probably in the next month or two is on Tadent Books website is start to put up one or two of the images, little teaser images and little bits of text and, and that. But the whole thing, I'm going to wait until the book is finished. It's all magically locked in place so that it's the baby is born. Then it will hit the world. You know, I'll put notices out on Tadent Books and on Quarrier and places like that. For now, I've just, you know, I, on my Facebook page, as you know, I, I keep it pretty locked down to people that I actually know, um, family, friends, things like that, simply because it started to become social media too difficult to deal with otherwise. And so I do put the pictures up on my private Facebook and people can then, my friends and family can see what I'm up to and I can get the occasional quiet message back going, well, that's okay, but, you know, and I'll get <laughs> good criticism, which is great because then, because I'm learning, I'm a beginner with this. So then I have to go back and look at it and go, fuck you, right. Okay, I need to work on that. And that's how I'm learning. You know, if everyone just goes, oh, that's nice, you don't learn anything. But if someone comes back and goes, well, you know, the legs are too short. This is wrong. That light falls in. You know, it's it, this is not quite right. But if you do that, just have a go with this. Have a go with that. I learned so much from people just offering little bits like that because there's quite a few artists on my Facebook. And, and that was lovely. And Because that's as a dancer, that's how you grow up is by somebody. It's not personal and it's not nasty. It's just some, yeah, that's fine, but blah, 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 go away and do it again, which is actually really good to grow up with because then you learn, you, you know, you've learned how to learn. Anyway, once it's ready, it'll be up on thegamecrafter.com. Print on demand is about the only way we're going to be able to go with it, sadly. I, I, when I first started it, I talked to Meredith at Kickstarter about maybe fundraising to do a print run. But the way things have gone now economically, because of course, you know, England, Britain is eating itself and is in a right fucking mess. I would have nowhere to store them. The post would be way too expensive and not reliable enough. There's, there's all these different variables and the actual printing itself would be eye-wateringly expensive because all of their costs have gone up because our electricity keeps doubling in price every three months. So having it out of England, 
printed in America on the gamecrafter.com, that will get it going. And they ship all over the world. You know, I know it's expensive, but they ship all over the world. It would probably be cheaper than the Quarrier deck because the Quarrier deck had to pay for the two artists three years of their life working on that deck. Um, those royalties is their payment. So, you know, it's paying two people there. This is just paying me. So it should be less unless Gamecraft have to put their prices up again. And I'll keep looking for other places, possibly in China, which would make it easier for people in Australia and places like that. And I do keep looking for print on demand in England. I found one that would actually work because the British don't get their heads around how print on demand dropship, platforming and dropship, all of that, they just don't get their heads around it. And they try and set it up as a business and they make it way too complicated and expensive. And I found one that could do it, that worked the right way. And they went bankrupt a month ago. It's like, oh, for fuck's sake. So for now, it's not going to be printed in the UK. But we've, for UK people, because we're cut off from the rest of the world now, thanks Brexit. So we're, a lot of stuff is trading on YTO rules. So, you know, things coming in and going out are expensive because of customs and uh, export import costs. So I will try and find a way to get it printed in this country. If we can find storage and someone to deal with that and we could fundraise for a print run, fine. But at the moment, that's not looking very likely. And I don't think asking people in this country to you know, put money towards a Kickstarter in this political and economic climate is a good idea because... We're going to literally have a lot of people dying this winter from either cold or starvation or both. And I'm not being overdramatic. This is really serious. The rich people will be fine. They just won't be quite as rich, but they won't even notice. For 50% of the population or more, this is going to be horrific, what's coming. So I don't want to put any more burden on anyone in this country. So the game crafter. That's where people will get it. And just bear in mind, I am constantly trying to find ways to make them available further afield. But do bear in mind, Gamecraft to do send all over the world. Josephine, thank you very much for that. And, and of course, as soon as there is a, a public update, we will make sure to you know share it and, and link to that. So th- thank you for that. And actually, a theme that you've touched on just you know in the last few minutes here is There are good times, there are times to learn and grow and develop, and then there are challenging times where you implement, where you where you practice what you preach, so to speak. And can you share with the listeners who are listening and going, okay, I know that times are tough. I know there's so much going on. What can I do magically? And why is it so important that there are no shortcuts? There are no easy ways to prepare for things and that it it really takes long term preparation. Yeah, it's it's a difficult one because when people find magic, depending on which country you're in, because this is everyone assumes that everything is about the USA, but it's there are other countries as well, and they have different things going on. For here in England, the good times came from the mid '60s. We had some bumps from the mid '60s to late '70s. And they weren't rich times at all, but they were good times, as in nice times. And then the separation started in the 80s between the rich and poor. But also there was a free market came in. So people were able to get much nicer food, nice clothes. They started to make money, you know, have nice things, have a good life, have a social life, all of that sort of thing. And that's been going on for, you know, the last... 30, 40 years, it's been a a good time. And now we're not in a good time, particularly in the UK. We're not going to be in a good time for a very long time and not just because of the economics. Now, in good times, people, when they come across things like magic or art and that, I don't want to put people down because I'm not. It's just maybe my vocabulary is getting limited um, with menopause, but people like to play. They like to dip in and out of things. They like to discover. And there's nothing wrong with any of this. 
you know, and they had the money to do it, buy books, you know, go on a course, do this, do that, have the outfits, look good. It's all, especially when you're young, that's part of, you know, being in your 20s and 30s is all of that comes together. The trouble is that when the bad times come, that magic that's, that's sort of dabbled around with is of no use. This is where the wisdom comes in. And they always say you can't put an old head on young shoulders. And I'm really starting to understand what that means now. The good times are the times when you have resources. So you use them. You use them if you want to be, you know, a kick-ass magician. You train in the good times. You spend that good weather doing your harvest. And you train and you learn how to look after your resources properly. This was a big problem because we had the 40 years of, of good, is that people thought it was never ending and that the peace was never ending. But actually, that 40 years was not the normal for the rest of the last how many hundreds, if not thousands of years. In the good times, you learned in depth. And then in the bad times, then you know how to use that magic to navigate your way through the difficult times. And it's not just about technique. It's a much bigger picture. This is what a lot of people don't understand with magic. They think if you go into a lodge and train and learn techniques and or you have a grimoire with the recipes and everything like that, that you've got magic. No, you don't. You have about 20%. The rest of it is inner contact. Your own inner sense is becoming so developed the divination is not usually necessary. You build a lot of these skills so that when you go into the bad times, you have this whole bag of really heavy skills that you can then use to navigate your way through and to help other people navigate their way through. One of the things that you mentioned, Josephine, to that exact point is that when things get tough in the world, people suddenly want to use and learn magic a bit like wanting to learn how to be a fireman when your house is already burning. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, when the bad times hit, people then want to use magic and they want to use magic because they're broke and they need more money or, you know, they're isolated and lonely and they, they want a partner or, you know, they need a job because they've just been made redundant. And the thing is, if you don't have the skills behind you, that recipe magic is going to blip at best. But also, you know, the recipe magic, you know, sort of results magic. And everyone assumes I think it's bad. I don't. You know, it has its place and it has its reasons. What I find bad with results magic is people going into it who do not understand the complexities of it and the events that can follow that you didn't think about. And what also makes me very angry is that, you know, people sell this shit to people in books by saying, oh, this is results magic. And if you learn this, this and this, you'll be able to get everything that you want. You'll be wealthy like me. The reason they're wealthy is because they're selling a fucking book telling other people how to be wealthy. And it really makes me angry because they put out results magic like that which is a valid form of magic, but they don't tell them the bad side of it or the dangerous, possible danger side or how to avoid the danger side of it and how to make it work in a way that doesn't cut across your own fate or fate patterns of other people, things like that. Results magic can be quite powerful, but, you know, it has to also be safe. It's like you, you don't use a fucking nuclear power station to power your light bulb, the whole complexity of magic is just totally ignored by these people that put these books out because these books sell big time. So yeah, they do make money. But using any form of magic during the bad time when they hit without the learning behind it, you know, going into it as a first thing that you do, yeah, you might get out of that immediate problem that you're in. But the problems that you've stored up ahead of you are not worth it because that can really backlash. And people go, oh, no, 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 no. And they always say this to me and they shout me down and this, that and the other. And, you know, I've now had 
30 years of people coming back to me going, how do I get out of this mess? And it's like, well, I told you 10 years ago not to put yourself in that mess. You had a choice. You know, I would mop them up, but I won't anymore. It's like, no, I'm not going to do that because this has been said enough. And that's, you know, so people coming into magic in the bad times, what the hell do they do? First thing is, is you need to make friends with other beings because that is one of the things that gets you through. You need to learn how to switch magic on and off, how to switch power on and off in a, in a balanced way. These are all really basics, by the way. The, these are not heavy techniques. And these can be found like in the first couple of modules of Quarry, which is why they're there. You know, people think that the core skills and, you know, the, and the first couple of modules are, are baby stuff. Oh, I don't need to do that. I'll just flip through it. No. Those skills that are in those that, that are developed through those exercises and lessons are a lot more than they appear on the surface. And if somebody could work with those and then go back to the beginning and work with them again, and then go back to the beginning and work with them again and become an adept just from those first two modules, because they are so heavily laid. And that was done intentionally because of the bad times that are coming. It's like you, when we were talking about this earlier, you said, you know, it's like wanting to become a fireman when your house is on fire. It's too late. You learn now basic skills. You make the basic friends. For example, that's how, you know, Stuart and I managed to ride out the pandemic and now the economic crisis so far is we had heads up beforehand. You know, I was buying in masks in 2017. I was starting to store money on the electric in 2019. I didn't know when it was coming exactly. I didn't know what was coming exactly. I just knew that we needed to have a lot of long life food, masks, sanitizer, gloves, medicine, remedies, that we needed to have a safety net financially, not a big one, but just enough, all of those things. And I kept thinking that the, like the food stock was for Brexit because there's a lot of food we just can't get now. Uh, it wasn't. It was because of the lockdowns. The first lockdown we had, we couldn't access food for a month here. The food store that we'd stocked up fed us for a month and got us through. And that all came from inner context. You need to do this. You need to do that. No, really, you really do need to do this. Come on, do a reading and have a look. So that's using inner contact and divination. And the divination wouldn't tell me exactly what was coming. It was just that it was bad. And yes, you need to stay home and you need to have food there. And you just need to keep your head down. And so when it started coming out with that again after Brexit, and then it was it was the pandemic, and now it's again this year, same thing. You know, every spare penny you've got, put it on the electric bill or put it in your bank account. You don't need to get that packet of biscuits. That one pound fifty, put it away. Right down to that level. And that's how I grew up because we grew up in tough times. So you know, I, I can cope with that. I know how to do that, how to put things away. And what took me to that was in a context, which meant working for a long time with beings on the land. I'm surrounded by beings here in the house and in the land. Your own daemon, the inner contacts of dead adepts that you work with and carry on working with. There's all these different types of beings and people and they're not there on all the time. But then when something bad is coming, somebody will break through and say, you know what, you need to do this. And they can't verbalize what it is that's coming because it's not in my mental vocabulary. So there's no word for them to use. They'll just say danger is coming and it's a type of danger where you need to have this, this and this. And then you need the skills then to open the gates up to do that, that and that. And also, as you in the good times and the magicians are training in the good times, and as some quarry students are finding out that during your training, you don't spend like, you know, years training and then you're a magician and off you go, is it starts while you're training, the inner contact really comes through, the powers start to come together because there's a necessity. 
you know, we're bridging into, we're not in bad times, we're bridging into bad times, so which gives you an idea of what's coming. You know, the students are, are finding that quite powerful contacts are stepping up and saying, I want you to do this, I want you to do that, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do reading for this, you need to stop doing that, you need to move house, you, you know, all these sorts of things. And then they're finding that, you know, they write it down in their journal a year later, something happens and the ones that have gone, oh, okay, I'll try and do that. Then they knew what it was for and they were ready. So, you know, get learning, but not trying to do sticking plaster jobs with magic. And that's the popular one, especially in Eastern Europe and Russia and places like that, is that sticking plaster magic you know, courtesy of communism is all that's left. And so that's what everyone focuses on is, you know, get me a boyfriend, get me a job. I want to be rich. I want a plane. I want a this. I want a that. It's an I want a magic, which inner contacts won't get involved in unless they're parasites and are taking you down a road where they can eat you at the end of it. Get learning properly. And the minute you start to open it out, the minute you do your first opening of the gates, the minute you do your first ritual cleansing, you start to tune into a pattern. And that pattern is like a, a civilization, for want of a better word. You are not alone. You then become part of learning on a path that has inner context, that has magicians around the world, that has insights, all of these different things. And for you in your particular area, doing your you know, your bit of training, if there's something big that's going to be coming at you in a year or two, you will get a heads up. So you don't need to be an adept. You get your heads up. And quarry training is not the only training that will do that. Serious magical training that uses inner contact, that works with a concept of balance and that works with ritual patterns will do the same thing. As long as it's not parasited, it will do exactly the same thing. As you're learning, you're also protected, which means you will be given heads up. You won't be overprotected. If you're given a heads up and they say, you know, you might need to get a lot of food in and store it. And this is not, you know, three big rooms full of dried beans, guns, and fuck knows what else that used to happen in the 90s. It's like, make sure you've got a month's worth of dried food you know, long life milk, tinned food, you know, whatever. Because I'm the skeptic. That's part of my personality. I always have been. And so a lot of the time they say, do this. And I go, yeah, whatever. And they say, no, really, do this. And I go, well, let me think about it. And then stuff would start flashing up, either driving down the road, I'd see a sign which would be saying something like, you need this food. Oh, you need storage. Oh, you, you know, all these little messages and stuff like, you need to plan ahead. And it's like, okay, for God's sake, I'll do it. So then I start buying in a bit extra each, each week with the shopping and, you know, putting brown rice, putting long life milk, you know, sauces, things like that in. And they back off because I'm doing what they asked me to do. So then they shut up and I'm back on my own again. And then as soon as another threat comes up, that I can't see that's big, they'll say, right, you need to do X, you need to do Y. And that starts from the very early stages of training. And so learning to dodge, be prepared, know when to put your head down, know when to put your head up. That's how you get through the dangerous times, not by doing results magic to stop the virus coming over your doorstep. For example, if you're in the pandemic and you're worried about getting COVID, I saw it on some social media, people doing these spells that COVID couldn't cross their threshold. Well, yeah, that's fine, but it can come through your window. You know, threshold magic works yeah. on your threshold. <laughs> Don't work on your window. It doesn't work on the shoulder of the person who's just coughed into their arm that walks over the threshold because you said... Don't let COVID come over. Well, this is not COVID. This is Frank. Frank might have COVID in his lung, but he's Frank, so he can come over the threshold. It's magic that doesn't understand complexities and layers. You know, do it, this great economic crisis. 
doing magic to, I need to have a thousand pounds to pay my electric bill. That's how high they, they're going to be getting. So doing results magic to get that thousand pounds to pay your electric bill, fine and good. You pay the electric bill. The next electric bill comes in. It's another thousand pounds. What are you going to do then? So you keep doing it. Where's the energy coming from to do that? What are you paying for it with? Because this is something that people don't understand. And it's not payment in the way we think of, you know, balance and payments. It's that, you know, doing that takes a certain amount of energy to actually make it work properly. It draws on your vital force. So a one-off is not probably going to do that much damage. Doing it regularly will start to eat away at your vital force. You have your vital force eaten away. You start dying slowly. You know, you get cancer. Your vital force helps to keep things at bay. You damage your vital force enough. I and mean, that's how old age works from an inner point of view. Your vital force starts to thin and fade away. It gets very, very low. And so the diseases, the cancers and all that sort of thing can take over and pass into the body. And your light very slowly goes out as long as you're not run over by a truck and then it goes out quickly. You know, people... You could do a whole podcast on the complexities of results magic. Results magic in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing and understands the complexity of it can be very powerful. Results magic in the hands of people who don't know what they're doing but think they do is dangerous for themselves and often for everybody else around them. So... What you do instead of that, waiting for the disaster to happen and then doing results magic to get a thousand. If you're working as a beginner or as a working magician, is your antenna are always listening. And something says bad times are coming, start to plan. So you plan and you do things. But then the bill comes and it's still too much and you can't afford it. You turn, you open the gates and you turn round to all the contacts and say, you know, I am trying to achieve this, this and this in my life. And this part of it is service, either magical service or mundane service. I am trying to achieve this. If my fate is supposed to achieve this, would you help me? And you let them help. You don't say, I need a thousand pounds. You say, will you help me? Because there's so many different ways that that problem can be solved and you're totally focused on the thousand pounds. You're not focused on somebody giving you a lot of solar panels as a gift, for example. I mean, over the years, over the decades, how this works just still blows my mind as the bizarre ways that it can come to you, how things that you need can come to you. I don't want to block people off from thinking that they can help their lives with magic because you can. It's like money. It works in a certain way. So you need money. You go to an ATM machine and you draw out a £1,000. You need to have a £1,000 in your bank account to draw it out. So, But for a child looking at an ATM machine, they just see adults go up, they're punching numbers, they're sticking a card and money pops out. That's so cool. You know, and I, I right. a pony. you know, give me a pony. Well, you can just go to the ATM machine and get the money. That's someone who doesn't understand the complexities of magic and who wants to do results magic to fix something that a mundane solution would fix. That's the other thing is 90% of what results magic is used for. You could just fix mundanely. It's not as simple and straightforward as it looks. It's not an ATM machine. So it just won't give you it. You know, 90% of results magic where the complexity is not thought through and it's not necessary. It just, you get a little blip, nothing really happens. It's a big and complicated, messy one. As you said, Josephine, it seems serendipitous. It seems like a bunch of these coincidences are just kind of piling up, but it's really it's really the reflection of many years, as you say, of truly deeply sincere, honest work. And by the way, work that's not sexy. You know, people oh, look yeah. at a look at a grimoire and they want to summon demons without looking at all of the deep, <laughs> deep years of preparation. And and also with Quaria, I tell this to people all the time. 
you know, Quaria is, as you say, the first two modules, when, when I went through those, deeply, deeply challenging and challenging in the most positive way because they're, they're saying, hey, listen, slow down. Instead of learning to add things, clean out a lot of the gunk that, that yeah. might have been built up or negative habits. So it's that yeah. core work. Yeah, you need to get the body fit before you can become a gymnast. Uh, listeners, how amazing was that? We are so thankful for Josephine's time and wisdom. And we often hear about how magic is art and art is magic. But hearing Josephine's nuanced and brilliant points about being receptive and, as she always says, paying attention was such a rejuvenating reminder that I know myself and I hope you too can integrate in our own rituals and esoteric engagements. By the way, this is part one of a new podcast with Josephine. The next podcast with Josephine will be focused on your amazing Glitch Bottle Patreon listener questions. And also, of course, Josephine's usual wisdom and insights that we can all benefit from in the good times and in the tough times. A huge thank you, by the way, to each and every Glitch Bottle patron on patreon.com slash glitch bottle. Your support of the podcast is the only reason that the show grows in new and interesting ways. There are no sponsors. There are no advertisements. It is just you. And if you'd like to hop on the Glitch Bottle caravan, please consider becoming an exclusive supporter of the show on patreon.com slash glitch bottle. As always, this is Alexander Eth reminding you to invoke often, uncork the uncommon, and keep the light.